hello everybody. So uh, we are really privileged here today to get uh, Professor Sebastian Galtier with us. And um, so let me first uh, give a short bio sketch of him. So Sebastian did his PhD, uh, completed his PhD in the year 1998 in Nice Observatory with Professor Anik Puke. And then he worked as a research assistant uh, in the United Kingdom uh, for, uh, till 2000, 2000. And after that, he joined as an assistant professor uh, in the Institute of Astrophysics Special uh, University Paris, where he spent 10 years. I mean, uh, so from, I mean, actually 11 years as, uh, like that. And then actually I was, uh, I mean, by then uh, his PhD student, I was in my, during, I mean, it was during my PhD. So he uh, then uh, changed his lab to Laboratoire de Physique de Plasma, which is uh, situated in the same plateau as that of the Ecole Polytechnique. But it is a, I mean, uh, but Sebastian is uh, still affiliated with the University Paris Saclay. And he is now our, um, I mean, professor of first class. And uh, so, I mean, I really don't need to uh, introduce uh, people with uh, Sebastian's work and science. I don't have that audacity. I would just like to add two things that Sebastian was my PhD supervisor. And uh, I was, I am one of the uh, very fortunate people who really cherish all the period of uh, the, their PhD thesis, and uh, and I still think that uh, he was an excellent teacher. But more above all, he was an ex I mean exceptional mentor. So I mean, uh, and uh, he I mean, unlike me, who being a student sometimes lost his patience, Sebastian never lost his patience, and <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing I am still trying to learn. Uh, and so in today's uh, I mean, audience, I also have my PhD students. So, I mean, so you can, should not compare uh, me with Sebastian at any cost because he is totally another level and another dimension. So anyway, so I am now, uh, just to uh, say that Sebastian today uh, will give a talk on gravitational wave turbulence in the primordial universe. The subject, that means the application of turbulence and uh, rather wave turbulence or weak turbulence in the field of cosmology or especially very popular gravitational wave was really a new subject by the year of 2016 when the gravitational field, I mean, the gravitational wave got the Nobel Prize. But then Sebastian and Sergei Nazarenko, these two people actually took the initiative and they uh, then published a lot of significant and what should, I should say some, uh, I mean, seminal papers Okay, so the first one was uh, accepted in PRL and then they published in Universe, Physicady and the most recent one. So just uh, yesterday, I mean, just last night, it was again accepted in the PRL. So Sebastian would like to give us a small voyage through this world of gravitational wave turbulence. So Sebastian, it's all up to you now. Okay, um, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. <laughs> um, I hope that you can hear me correctly. Um, so, um, my uh, presentation is about turbulence, but also about cosmology. And I assume that you are not a specialist of cosmology, so I will uh, have a brief introduction on this uh, subject. As uh, uh, Patrick said, um, my work on this subject is mainly uh, shared with uh, Sergei Nazarenko. Uh, okay, yeah. So I'm going to start with something that you, you know, and with this movie, um, as said by uh, Spratik. Um, in uh, February 2016, the first paper about uh, the detection of gravitational waves was published in uh, Physical Letters and um, as you, you know, probably it's um, this uh, observation, this detection was the result of the merger of two black holes. So you see in these different movies, uh, made just by computers, it's not an observation, um, the different uh, examples. There are now today many examples of observations. And um, this observations was made with, uh, as you know, with uh, this uh, US uh, interferometer called LIGO. 
uh, two interferometers in US. And uh, also now, today, there is one in, uh, in uh, Europe, Virgo, where, uh, with which we can uh, um, make detections. Uh, the first thing that you have to, to, to see here on this movie is that um, the time scale. The time scale is on the top right. You see that it's very short. So it's a, a dramatic event, this fusion, this merger of black holes. And uh, below these oscillations actually corresponds to the oscillations, the space-time oscillations. As you see, the frequency is increasing and that at the end, uh, the signal uh, stops because we arrive to a new body, a new black hole. And the difference of mass between the final black hole and the two initial black holes uh, is um, difference is, um, there is a difference, and this difference is converted into a gravitational energy and a lot of energy. And well, so I will just show you this movie until the end. And um, what I can tell you is that the latest observation actually was uh, published, I guess, maybe there is another one, in July in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Uh, and in this paper, you see uh, you see all these examples. There are like thirty examples, maybe more than thirty uh, uh, observations today. Um, so, is it interesting for my talk? It is interesting, of course, because gravitational waves it's uh, the main subject of my talk in turbulence. But in fact, it is not so interesting because. Uh, the production of uh, waves is, I mean, uh, on Earth, the detection on Earth was, as you know, very difficult because um, the amplitude of the, of the waves uh, are very, very weak. And they are so weak that we cannot expect any nonlinear effects. Um, and so we need, uh, I need to explain where these physics, uh, these weak turbulence, especially uh, of gravitational waves, can be useful. You see here, uh, the name LIGO, you can go to the site if you want and download this movie. So where is it interesting? Uh, in this uh, slide, I explain briefly the history of the universe. There are many informations, and this is what we, we need to know. It's here, I think. So let me explain. At the top, uh, we are here, actually. So today, the time is on the right today, and here is not, it's not linear, but we, we start at the Planck time. If we start at the bottom, uh, basically um, the form of my uh, plot here means uh, that uh, we have expansion of the universe. Basically, today we are at the center of the observable universe. By definition, it's, we are the center. Um, and that means also that it is just a sample of the universe. The universe can be much greater. It can be even infinite, we don't know. But if we take this just this sample and we go we observe the sky, as you know, we can go back and observe that we have different uh, ex phase of expansions. And, um, and uh, actually uh, the first phase uh, where we are today, it's a phase of acceleration of expansion. This was discovered like 25 years ago. And um, usually we people say that it's due to dark energy. The term dark energy means that we don't know, in fact, what, what precisely we have behind this um, physics. So before this time, uh, we had, uh, I would say, a normal expansion with different uh, important times. The first one is uh, at this time. Uh, I hope that you can see my uh, arrow at time like um, 380,000 years. Um, this is the first light called cosmological microwave background. So this is the limit of observation of the universe. We cannot go beyond by observation because there is no light. And uh, on the left, you see the temperature of this first light. And today, as you know, uh, this background is at 2.7 Kelvin. And um, what, what also you also know if from that observation, it, it's, this background is very uniform. Um, there is a, it's very uniform and um, this is, uh, an important point for, for my presentation. Before that, we had uh, two uh, important times. The first one is the electro electroweak transition, phase transition, during which gravitational waves are uh, expected to be produced. And, um, uh, and, and even before that, um, we had this uh, uh, good uh, phase transition where stronger gravitational waves 
uh, are expected to be produced. And are actually, there are, it, it is believed that this wave is strong enough in amplitude to uh, produce non-negligible nonlinear effects. So basically, the domain of application that uh, I will talk about at the end of my presentation is the domain that you see on the right, this uh, arched uh, region here. So around this phase of inflation. So basically at the beginning when uh, we can use general relativity. Of course, we cannot use the, this, uh, this theory close to the Planck time. As you know, we need quantum gravity. Okay, so um, now just uh, a last Bro, one for- Can I ask Sebastian one question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this dark energy era is only last 25, I mean, how many years uh, is dark energy era when expansion is taking place? Uh, well, more, more or less, you? yeah, more or less like I would say five, uh, um, I think it's five billion years like that. I mean, the last, this is the last, I mean. Uh, I see, part. 10 billion yeah. to 15 million, okay, so 10 million. Yeah, more or less. Okay. Uh, and so there is a, this inflation phase. So why, why so inflation, does, what does it mean? It means that we have an expansion but a super expansion in the sense that an expansion faster than the speed of light. Why do we need this? We need this because if we come back to today, so here at the top, if we, I take here two points, two regions, far from each other to be uh, causally disconnected, it's difficult to understand why the sky that we observe is the same, mainly the same. I mean, uh, this uh, CMB is, uh, quasi uniform on the sky. And it's difficult to understand. However, if we suppose that very early around that time, we had this phase of inflation, that means these two points were actually before that causally connected. So imagine that we have turbulence and then the signal can be uh, uh, homogenized, then uh, inflation just uh, put these points far from each other. So that's mainly one of the reasons of uh, the, the importance of inflation. Okay, so this is what I want to say here in the introduction. Last slide about this, it's uh, this background, this uh, microwave background, what also I think you know that, but just to give you some dates. Uh, the first observation was made in the 60s by Pierre Diaz and Wilson. And then they, 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 we have actually here three space missions, telescopes, for the observation of this background. And uh, the first one was Kobe, then WMAP, and the last one was Planck. And the main message from that um, uh, observation is that this uh, temperature is almost uniform, but not exactly. There are some anisotropy, which is observable here, but very small anisotropy. Very small, but very crucial because it is believed that it's because it is non-uniform that we can create structures later, like finally galaxies and so on. So this is important to have this slight, I um, mean, uh, in homogeneity in the signal. Okay, so this is the introduction. I will come back at the end and explain why turbulence can be useful to uh, understand uh, inflation. Turbulence, you know turbulence. I think you are, all of you are specialists. So I will tell you something very basic here. I can be fast maybe, uh, quick. I mean, here this is just, to illustrate uh, the main uh, properties of turbulence cascade, we can have a direct cascade or an inverse cascade. This is an illustration in 2D. It's a simulation that I made. Uh, at the top, it's MHD, magnetohydrodynamics, and uh, at the bottom, it's uh, just uh, hydrodynamics. And you know that we have an inverse cascade in one case and a direct cascade if I plot the current density at the top in the other situation. Well, you know that. I don't need, I think, to explain very much. Uh, this point. Then you also know that the Kolmogorov spectrum, we observe uh, very easily in water, uh, this, uh, this K minus five third, uh, which is the result of a cascade of ADs. And the thing that I would like to emphasize here is that uh, this is, uh, when we talk about turbulence, we usually think about uh, Navisoaks, ADs, cascade of, uh, I mean, this Kolmogorov cascade, this K minus five third. And we observe that with a spectrum where we take two points in physical space, go to a spectral space. You know all of that, I think, for sure. But uh, there is another regime which is uh, less known, uh, where actually there are more examples in physics. It's wave turbulence. 
Wave tubules is a situation where tubules can be weak and strong, strong like for AD tubules, but also weak. And my talk will be mainly about weak tubules. Uh, so the example that I like very much, it's the solar wind because we clearly observe waves and turbulence. I will not talk about the regime, is it weak or strong, but just, I mean, we have many waves in plasmas. It's very easy to observe that, to produce that. And uh, in this very nice plot, I like very much this uh, spectrum because I think in, in turbulence, this is the best example in the sense that we have here eight decades of power laws, different regions and so on. So I will not describe that, but just to show that if we plot the magnetic spectrum here, uh, versus the frequency, we can get the MHD scale at the middle uh, of the plot uh, called here the initial range and then uh, the sub-ion range where a lot of things, a lot of questions are still open like the, the, the manner that, the, manner that uh, the plasma is heated. And actually, uh, Supratic made an introduction. He worked during his PhD thesis uh, about the compressible effect on this uh, subject. So if you have questions, just ask Supratic, not, not me here. <laughs> uh, Okay, so weak turbulence now. So when the amplitude is weak, or the wave amplitude is weak, then we can do, we, we talk about weak wave turbulence or simply wave turbulence. And the interesting thing is that in this case, we can uh, develop a theory um, for describing these weakly nonlinear systems. And we can develop, a, I mean, an analytical theory for that in spectral space. There are two well-known books about weak turbulence. The one is by Zakharov, published uh, 30 years ago. And the other one is by Sergei Nazarenko, published 10 years ago. So they are written in English on all of, or, or, I mean, these books are about weak wave turbulence. More recently, I published a book, but it is in French, about turbulence in general. But I, I show you that because, uh, well, I, I plan to, 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 to write an English version of this, this book, maybe next year. Um, and, but if you want to, have, to, have, to, to read this book, you can, again, ask uh, Supratik because he has uh, one version. Uh, okay, so what, is, what are the main things to say about weak wave turbulence? There are two positive things, first of all. Um, as I said, we can develop a, a theory for that. And because of uh, the weak uh, amplitude, the weak nonlinearities, we have in this system a natural asymptotic closure uh, in the sense that the time scale of the wave, the wave period, is much smaller than the nonlinear time. And this was uh, I mean, developed in the 60s by Benet, Safman, people like that, and Newell, um, with uh, uh, example taken from uh, the sea, I mean, uh, surface waves, this kind of examples. Then when we have the, the equations called the kinetic equations for like energy in spectral space, uh, we can actually also find exact solutions. And this uh, very nice thing was uh, uh, discovered by uh, Zakharov um, and Filonenko in the 60s, about the same date. Um, and so, I mean, when I say exact solution, it corresponds to exact stationary finite flux solutions. So that's very nice thing. We can get uh, precise uh, information about uh, weak wave turbulence. Um, I would say the negative uh, thing is that weak turbulence is always valid in a finite domain uh, in wave numbers. And for example, if I take MHD, it's known that if we start with weak MHD, then we go to a strong MHD turbulence at small scales. We have a direct cascade in this situation. From now DNS or experiments, uh, there are also limitations because uh, experiments, of course, is very difficult. So if we want to, uh, and also, I mean, for example, if I take rotating turbulence, I give here this examples paper published by people in Orsay, in Saclay, Maurice et al. You have to, to be sure that your system in a, is in a good position to produce wave turbulence because weak wave, because we also have the possibility to, to mix weak and strong wave turbulence. That's another complication. And from a DNS, DNS means also uh, by definition, uh, your, your simulation are discretized and uh, discretization can lead sometimes to some limitations, some problems. Okay, maybe I'll ask you one question. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so this finite flux spectra not valid. I didn't understand. Uh, so, you mean the flux is varying with wave number? Uh, uh, so, sorry, which point? The second, the, the, three, the point three, third point. point. Three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I say that, it's because it becomes strong. I mean, uh, we we have a flux. I mean, uh, but I mean the, the exact solution. Are, 
not valid in uh, in any domain. It's even more complex, as you know, for MHD. Even if we are in the weak turbulence uh, domain in terms of wave numbers, there is a layer close to the you know two D case where it's more complex. So two D, I mean, the, the slow mode k equals zero corresponds mm -hmm. to strong turbulence. So there is this uh, complexity and uh, in plasma physics so the anisotropy in this uh, in turbulence that's what you mean yeah 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 but uh, well no it's i took i took this example mhd anisotropy but if you if you take for example uh, let's take um, i don't know uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, gra gravity waves maybe or or, or i mean <laughs> gravitational waves Okay. Uh, there is an there is an inverse cascade. We start with weak turbulence. Okay. It's uh, isotropic, and then at small wave number, at large scale, we reach uh, uh, strong turbulence. So that, that, that's what this is what I mean. I mean by okay, okay, I got it. So it's a negative point in the sense that, of course, uh, I mean we can have decades of weak turbulence, but uh, it's limited. And uh, okay, continue, please. Yes. Okay, so now uh, just examples, uh, since uh, in it's, it is an introduction, um, there are many examples of where weak wave turbulence is observed. So this is a movie, but I don't know if you can hear that. Can you hear? We can't hear you, but... Uh... Okay, because, because see the oscillations. <laughs> okay, because there is a more, the noise, but well, it's very noisy actually. So just to show you that, if you take a metallic plate, if you start, to, you, you can do weak turbulence. I mean, just a perturbation. Of course, you will not produce eddies, but waves. And I would say that during the last twenty years, uh, a lot of experiments uh, were, were, were developed to uh, try to observe this this regime. And uh, personally, when I was PhD student twenty five years ago. Uh, I started to work on weak turbulence, but people were not totally uh, convinced that it was possible to, to observe physically this regime. Does it exist or not? Because it, experimentally, it was um, not really observed. I mean, clearly observed. And, and from simulation, it was very difficult to observe. But today, with DNS and experiments, new experiments, there are a lot of examples. So this is one example. Uh, with uh, um, with this uh, metallic plate, but also uh, the first one was uh, capillary waves and gravity gravity waves. So I, I give you a lot of examples. Uh, we not describe very much this slide. Just I like very much below at the bottom left this uh, sphere. Actually, it's uh, a situation of zero gravity. They put water inside a sphere, and uh, you see capillary waves here. So I, I like very much. This is nice. If you are interested, you go to and read this paper published in 2009 here. And uh, more recently, uh, there is also a paper published by people in Asakle about rotating turbulence, uh, publishing physical revelators like a year ago. So a lot of activities, I mean, in this domain. So, but you know turbulence, maybe not so much wave turbulence, but you have now uh, information and cosmology. So back to cosmology, I made an introduction now I need to say more and explain uh, uh, the, what I did and what we did and what are the, the equations. So of course the equations are these uh, general, general relativity equations, Einstein's equations, as you see here. You are probably, probably not familiar with, with that. So what, what is this? It is actually uh, a system of 10 nonlinear partial differential equations, 10 because this equation is symmetric in mu and mu, mu. And um, well, what can I say about this? There are different terms. First of all, in the right here, this is, uh, as I've written, I think below, this is a stress, stress energy tensor, basically the source of curvature of, curvature of the space time. Okay, the source of space time curvature. Uh, if you look at on the right this picture, which is very familiar for, for you. It's if you have a star or planets, you know that you have a curvature. So the source will be in the right hand side here. In the left hand side, you have three terms. One term proportional to lambda, lambda is a cosmological constant. This is often introduced, ex especially to, for example, to understand the current expansion of the universe. If you uh, take the good value for lambda, then you can have models and explain uh, the observations. In my case, I will neglect this term, okay? So I will not have lambda. 
In my case, also, I will consider an empty universe. So the term in the right-hand side will be zero. So that means I can consider a perturbation, but the source of the perturbation, if I come back here to this picture, I hope that you see my arrow, that means if you have an oscillation there, I will be there and feel waves going through this region. But the source will not be inside my domain of uh, study, okay? And finally, there are two terms. This is uh, called uh, the Ricci scalar, and this is the Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor is actually a complex term because you have, here's the definition, gamma is called uh, the Christopher symbol, and this is a, uh, basically a combination of the metric. So the metric is a basic field of general relativity, and you see that it is uh, quadratic here. Uh, this term. So you have quadratic terms here, and here it's even higher in terms of uh, nonlinearities. Okay, uh, now, so this was published by Einstein and uh, the first solution that is very well known is the waves, the gravitational waves. How can we get gravitational waves? Uh, basically, I come back here. Uh, we say that we are in the empty universe. So the term in the right here is zero. There is no, we neglect this constant. So we have to solve the two terms first. One. But in this case, uh, mathematically R becomes I mean, is equal to zero. So basically we have to solve uh, this term if we are in the, uh, if the universe is empty basically, and if we neglect the, the, this uh, cosmological constant. To get waves, then we have to linearize this term. So basically the linearization means that we, con we, we take for the metric, we take a flat space time that you, you know probably, you have seen this in, um, uh, for eta, and we have a small perturbation. Then we derive equation and we find waves, gravitational waves. And the property of this wave is that it is a, a non-dispersive wave with uh, CK here, C is the speed of light. And this movie means that it's an example to, to illustrate a wave for which H, the perturbation is uh, 0.5, which is huge. So that means if a wave here goes through this plane, the screen of my computer, of your computer, then, uh, there is a modification if uh, actually the points are initially along a circle, we have this, this motion, this modification. So it's a quite strong modification. So this is a solution. And actually I have to say that there are two kinds of waves because we have two po possible polarization. One of these is along the diagonal. And this is the one that I will consider in my, uh, as you will see in my presentation uh, later. Uh, this is th this wave is will be described not the other one which correspond to uh, off diagonal term uh, um, here. Okay, so now we arrive to the I don't know one more one more. I'm sorry, I'm asking you too many questions. Yeah, you're so, not sure. Yeah. So what does it mean? These are the space points which are expanding, contracting. Uh, so what what do those uh, points mean? The black dots. Yeah, well, you can, it, this is matter, you, you can, uh, I, I will not say that it is planets because I don't need, <laughs> but you have ma matter al along a circle initially. And when a wave, gravitational wave cross, crosses this, uh, this plane, then uh, space time will uh, contract and, and you know, uh, nice. dilatation and contraction. So that means the distance will be different actually. Nice. So this is what but you see here. Self coming close and going away. Coming yeah. Away, is it? Yeah, is yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. But this is really, I mean, big is 0.5. Okay. okay. So next, uh, well, for now, if we want to do turbulence and weak turbulence, we need to consider nonlinear terms. And uh, then we still have H small, but I will not linearize the system. And I will solve this equation, as I said, R mu nu equals zero, lambda is equal to zero. The first term that we have, in principle, it's a quadratic term, then a cubic term, and so on and so on. And uh, the first result that we, we proved in our paper published in 2017, it's that actually for weak turbulence, um, we have for three waves, if it is quadratic, it is three waves, we have this dispersion relation. Actually, this situation is like acoustic waves, for which we know a lot of things. Um, and actually, if we take this solution and we put it inside the equation, we, we, we find, we found that actually there is no uh, nonlinear contribution. There is constellation of terms. So uh, that means if we do a theory for that problem, we need to consider the next order that means cubic terms. So that means to be a theory for four waves, not three waves. 
So four ways means like, for example, non-linear tests or, and, or I mean, there are also problems, but this is, um, I mean, like also uh, elastic waves, um, tubules. And uh, actually this, I mean, result, as you will see, it's compatible with the DNS that I will show you later. So now we arrive to the technical point and uh, I, I mean, I cannot describe, I mean, all the I mean, mathematics, of course. And so, I, and especially if you don't know, I mean, cosmology, this is a very special, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a way to uh, analyze a problem. Uh, so first of all, when we do cosmology, we need to define the metric. Uh, by uh, define the metric, I mean to uh, define uh, the variables. So we took actually um, this metric uh, proposed by Haddad and Zakharov, Vladimir Zakharov, uh, who worked also on this problem. Uh, in, uh, he published a paper in 2014. So it's a diagonal metric. And you see the variables, OK? So there are four variables, alpha, beta, gamma, and lambda. And the assumption is, for simplific to, to, to simplify the problem, is that there is no z-dependence. So there is x, y, and t dependence, not z. And this is very interesting because it simplifies a lot the problem, but the problem is still non-trivial in the sense that we have waves and we have non-linearities. And OK, so what they did, um, and this is actually, this is valid for any waves, it can be weak or strong. But in our case, uh, here I limit myself to weak amplitude. That means I can actually simplify and neglect some terms. So they, they derived in this paper the Lagrangian. So there is a small calculation. I will not show you that. And then we derive the Hamiltonian and we derive the kinetic equations. So this is technical. There is one point that you, you need to just to realize when we use um, the general relativity. So this is the next slide. And here, this equation that we have to solve, as I told you, there are 10 equations. But as you have seen, there are four variables. So it can be a problem. So you have to check that. First of all, because of the independence in the z direction, three of these are trivially zero. So we have still seven equations for four variables. And still, it can be a problem. And But Haddad and Zakharov published a theorem in their paper to show that these three terms that you have here are fully compatible with the four other equations. So basically, that means we can take this I mean, metric and uh, use just four equations, four variables, everything is fine. And this is a technical point, but important. So then, uh, then we arrived, to, this is very complex. Just to show you how to have a picture of this Hamiltonian. This is big stuff. And um, uh, lambda is uh, one of the variables, the, the main variable. And uh, we, we use so these different um, equations to get this big Hamiltonian. Then for four ways. And then we simplified it. So I will go just fast because it's not interesting. This is interesting. This is a, a slide, uh, uh, important slide. So after uh, pages of a calculation, we arrived to a form which is absolutely classical in weak wave turbulence for a problem with four waves. And this is an equation for, so the variable A, so corresponds to basically, um, if I come back here to um, lambda, okay, which is one of the four variables. So basically N is a wave action. So energy is just omega, the frequency times N, okay? So basically this is an equation that you have here, which is, um, as I said, very classical. The difference between, for example, this problem on elastic wave turbulence is in this term T. T has this symmetry, I will say as usual, but the difference is that Q here, this term, has this form. This is, uh, I mean, particular to uh, general relativity. But the form is similar. So when we arrive to this equation, then everything was absolutely simple in the sense that we can use the toolbox of turbulence and get exact solutions and so on and understand this uh, better, this, this system. So what are the solutions? So physically, this is the interesting part, the bottom part of the slide. What are the solutions? There are two invariants, energy and wave action. And we always have energy, this concern, but wave action is not always present. For example, we need four waves. In three waves, this is not invariant, but four waves is not enough. We need sufficient symmetry in the system. And this system actually uh, has a good symmetry. So this is what I have written there. Three to one is zero. Three to one means in terms of, uh, of interactions, that means uh, if I use K1, K2, K3, K4, that means K1 
equals k2 plus k3 plus k4 gives uh, no contribution to this equation. And we have checked that every term like that gives zero. There is no, there is this symmetry, this additional symmetry. And then we have uh, this second invariant we have actually. For which the solutions are given below. Uh, this is an exact solution. So a flat spectrum for the energy and the K minus two third for the wave action. Uh, Sebastian, so just I would, uh, I wonder if we can uh, draw a correspondence between something, for example, energy we know, like let's say, if, uh, I mean, our traditional physics, like in classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, so wave action, uh, what is the correspondence of this thing in our traditional non normal physics thing? I mean, wave action is, uh, well, wave action is, it's energy divided by the frequency. Uh, it's uh, observed in uh, different system. As I said, in elastic wave turbulence, we have wave action. It's not necessarily quantum physics. Uh, this is an invariant that you have sometimes. In terms of particle physics, we, we talk about conservation of particles. So it is, it is more like the number of quanta type of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we have these exact solutions of uh, this uh, problem. And the point is that the most interesting one is the, the wave action spectrum. Why? Because uh, we have here in this case an explosive inverse cascade. Explosive, that means if we excite the system at wave number ki, then we can uh, uh, excite every wave numbers until k equals zero in a finite time. However, for the energy, it's, uh, the situation is different. It's a slow direct cascade in the sense that the direct cascade takes an infinite uh, uh, um, time to, to start to, to, I mean, to uh, excite wave numbers from ki to k equals infinite. So, uh, so that means the physics will be driven mainly by the explosive, the explosive inverse cascade. So that's the point here. And that's why I'm going to talk about that quantity that we have studied in this paper that you have um, here uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, here, uh, this is a way to derive uh, physically the previous power laws. We can do mathematics, right? But we can do also, uh, we can be, I would say, more clever. We can just do that in three lines. Uh, like physicists by using good arguments. So the good arguments are the following. In uh, here, this problem for weak turbulence, we have the kinetic equations for um, these uh, variables. And we know that um, the problem is solved at for four waves, not for three waves. So that means the first term that we have usually is not present and we need to go to the next order. So that means epsilon to the fourth. Epsilon is a small parameter, the ratio between the wave time and the nonlinear time, okay? And then the phenomenology is classical for weak turbulence in the sense that we know that the cascade time is a wave time multiplied multiply by a B coefficient, which is one over a small parameter to the fourth. Okay, that means to get a cascade, uh, we need not just, we we'll say one period of the waves, but much more um, to have interaction between waves. And this is, uh, especially for four waves, it's, it's longer than for three waves. Then uh, if you have this time, just put it on, if I just take the energy, uh, if you follow this uh, phenomenology, you have energy divided by the time scale and just, just play with wave numbers, the relation between also the energy and uh, the fluctuation, H is the space-time fluctuations, L is a typical length scale. So you can just say that one over L is K and then by playing with that, you get the spectrum. So the flat spectrum, okay? Uh, and I, I yeah. have a I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I can totally see a somehow a similarity between this and uh, so-called traditional Hiroshnikov Krishnan type of phenomenology, where you have like uh, very weak interaction between two Alvin packet type of thing. So uh, here your TGW, so there we had like uh, the collision time. So uh, between two, uh, prop I mean, counter propagating Alvin packets here, what is the meaning of T, I mean, tau G omega and how, I mean, the, what is the picture of that? Is there any collisional picture or something? Yeah, good question. Uh, there is no, in the literature, uh, uh, this picture of co collisional waves. I don't think it is a good picture. There is a, in this problem uh, uh, because, um, well, if there is this picture, as I said, this, you, have, you have to think that you have many waves and the nonlinear terms are not, uh, I would say, uh, 
uh, only uh, terms with collisional waves. There are many different terms. Okay. So uh, this picture for MHD actually is very special. I mean, we have this picture, but uh, this is not here the same situation. Okay. okay. Um, and this is a good question because I, I, I would, I, I mean, um, the question is also behind your question is why physically we don't have three waves. Mathematically, we don't have, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we can prove that this is easy, but then physically, physically, does it mean that we don't have Counter propagating gravitational waves. Uh -huh. uh, maybe the answer is yes. Maybe this is why, uh, if the universe is empty and if there is no, I mean, um, cosmological constant, if it is not, then it, it could be different. But in this specific case, the answer could be there is no collisions between, no, no I mean, contribution of the collisions. I don't say there is no collision, there is collision, but the contribution is probably not uh, relevant in the resonant, uh, um, for the resonant condition, I would say. So if there is a deformation, let's say, I mean, uh, if, I mean, for example, like Kolmogorov type, so of course there is a deformation of the structure, right? If we try to make some analogy of this scale, I mean, from one scale to other, so, I mean, there should be some distortion. So that distortion is purely due to the, I mean, gravitational, I mean, the due to the distortion of the space time of the, uh, due to gravitational wave, or there is something else, or I mean, I'm missing something. No, no, this is that. I mean, you have uh, here, uh, uh, you have this, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, modification of space time due to the propagation of waves. And uh, uh, you can see that are like, I mean, uh, wave packet of uh -huh. gravitational waves. And this, I think the picture is, is still correct. That's not okay. a, uh, a problem. Okay, okay. Thank you. Just to cross check. Okay. Uh, okay, so now, uh, this is now a, sim a first simulation. It's not a DNS. DNS means direct, direct numerical simulation. It, this is a simulation of a model of the problem. Why? Because we wanted to, um, to have, uh, to, to study more specifically this inverse cascade, because there are something interesting in general when the cascade is explosive. One way to do that is to say, okay, we have this big kinetic equation, and we are going to assume that um, the interactions are local. In wave numbers. And then if you do that, sometimes, like in um, non nonlinear optics with this paper by Diashenko, or also in MHD or here in kinetic alpha waves, we can make this assumption on the kinetic equation and get uh, what we call a nonlinear diffusion equation. Here the problem is too complex. Uh, we, we tried, but it's too complex. So we just propose the model um, and uh, like that, which is built on of course, I mean, on the fact that we have four, uh, four waves and we have an inverse cascade and so on. So it is built, I mean, uh, as it should be. And then we made a simulation, okay? So this is a nonlinear term. This is uh, the first, the second term on the right, it's a dissipative term at small scales. And we have an hypo dissipation here at large scale because we have an inverse cascade, we need it. And what this simulation tells, tells you, it's that if we start here, it's a decay, decay simulation. We have an inverse cascade, right? Okay. And apparently minus two thirds is observed. So fine, it's not very new. I mean, it's not necessary to develop the model since the theory is, uh, is more, I mean, global than this one. So yes, it is not interesting. What is interesting as the flux as you see is negative. It's if you look at very carefully this inverse cascade during this propagation, it's not two thirds, it's slightly different. And this is now, here the pictures that you have at the top. If you look at carefully, this phase of propagation is uh, characterized by a spectrum with a power low zero minus zero point six five one seven. It's not two so minus two zero. And actually, it's classical in turbulence. This is not maybe very well known, but during the non-stationary phase, if the turbulence, if the cascade is explosive, the power law can be different. Sometimes the difference is big, like in MHD. In weak turbulence, it's minus two, the solution. And uh, during the phase of propagation, it's minus seven third. So it's a big difference. Here, this is very small. So this is the goal of the paper here, to prove that, to analyze this, and to prove that it's a self-similar solution during the non-stationary phase, okay? So if you want more details, just go to the paper and see what kind of analysis we are able to do. But because it's a nonlinear diffusion model, it's very easy to do simulation of decades of power laws and just look at it very carefully. And here you have a list of paper where it is it was discussed. 
Okay, now this is the main point of my talk, uh, the DNS. Um, and I'm going to show you the first DNS of gravitational wave turbulence. I would say of turbulence in general relativity. Okay, so uh, as uh, Supratik said, uh, the paper was uh, accepted this night, but you can find it, you can find the final version on archive. Uh, you have here the, 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 the reference. So what uh, I developed the code uh, uh, here, it's, uh, I mean, the philosophy it's, I'm from turbulence like you, and I want to study this problem like usual, as usual, I mean. So that means I'm going to take a box, a periodic box, I'm going to use a classical tool. So that means FFTW, periodic condition, the aliasing, pseudo total code. Uh, there is no forcing, just decaying turbulence. Because it's a decaying turbulence, I also have dissipation, just to be sure there is no problem because there is an inverse cascade, but also a direct cascade. And um, since I'm going to, to study this dual cascade, I mean, direct and inverse, I will excite the system initially at an intermediate wave number, okay? Resolution is, seems to be low, 512 squared, but it took 45 days to do this simulation that is going to be published. It's very long. The reason is because the time step is very small and the time step is very small because these equations are very sensitive, very in instable. I mean, uh, uh, this is a necessity to have very small time step to, be, to, to have a very nice result as you see. So this is the result. First of all, uh, here you follow at the top left the energy. It's a decay simulation. And as you see, uh, this is normalized with initial value of the energy. We have a plateau and then a decay. Uh, if I plot the log log, it's a decay low, I mean a power low uh, here in this case, close to t, t minus one uh, fourth. So we say it's a classical behavior. If you take MHD, uh, Navistokes, you have a power low decay. And again, here power low decay. So clearly that means we have uh, here, because we have a direct cascade of energy, that means at that time, uh, you see the, the, this segment, I mean, dashed line, different colors correspond to different times for the spectrum that I'm going to describe in a moment. So we have basically direct cascade and we reach here uh, the dissipative scales and then decay. Now, uh, bottom precisely, so still here top. Uh, the time scale is normalized to the gravitational time. We need a time and the time is defined with um, the initial excitation, which is Ki, so uh, one over omega i is one over Ki. So this is uh, the normalization. And you see that uh, the time here, it's like 10,000 gravitational time to have uh, this uh, behavior. And this is uh, compatible actually with four waves. Why? Because for four waves, we have this scaling law. Okay, and um, so actually it's, it's, there is a mistake, it's epsilon minus four actually here. So, and for three waves, it's epsilon minus two in power. So it's much faster. So, I mean, if it was two waves, that means the time scale would be here like uh, 100, not 10,000, okay? So below now, below here we have the spectrum. So this is a very nice result. The excitation that you see, so this is a wave action normalized, I mean, uh, by uh, the solution, expected solution. In K, the initial uh, excitation is here uh, at uh, wave number 89, so the dashed line, and then you see the evolution. So first of all, we have a, a direct cascade on inverse cascade, and then we reach a dissipative scale. It is not written there, but at uh, wave number 140, there is um, a strong dissipation, okay? Um, and then, the cascade, of course, stops, but the inverse cascade, as you see with the green, the red, the blue, uh, continues, and the colors here correspond to the colors here, okay? So you see that the green on red is between uh, here, and this is precisely the time uh, from which uh, we have here uh, reached here the dissipative scales, okay? And it's more or less flat. I will not say it is exactly two third minus two third, but it's, well, it's flat, and it is uh, also, I will say, uh, uh, I mean, um, convincing that we have the real cascade and we have uh, something close to the expected result. Here in this uh, small plot, you have the 2D plot here. And I don't know if you can see, there is a small white circle, circle here. This is my initial condition. And then you see that we have a lot of wave numbers excited. Uh, the dashed lines here, line correspond to the 
scale uh, from which I applied a very strong dissipation. So this is a dissipation zone here. And you see that there are a lot of information, especially there is this dark, I mean, I mean the kind of font uh, that uh, propagates here towards small wave numbers. And you see here actually the font, this is, this is the bump here that you have. So is it wave turbulence? To be sure, a uh, way to do that is to also plot the omega k spectrum uh, here. To plot this, what I did actually is to, if I come back to this, to this spectrum, I took points along this diagonal, okay? So let's say this one at k equals like, like uh, kx, ky equals 4t. So then I took the, the, the field, I mean the basic field of my uh, uh, simulation, uh, the normal variables, and just a following time, okay? And then I fully transform uh, this signal and if I plot that for k equals 40, actually it's not 40 because it's kx equals 40 and ky is equal 40. So that means uh, there is square root of two, but well, let's say it's 40. And then you just excite this point, okay? And the dotted lines actually, uh, the omega equals ck that I have plotted. So it's really on the dispersion relation, except here at the very beginning, I mean, for small k, we have a dark region here. So that means it's really wave, weak wave turbulence. So have many ways of different frequencies and it produces this inverse cascade, okay? So next thing is also now um, about um, the, the, the metric because uh, we can of course reproduce this, uh, the theory but we also, we can also investigate um, the, um, the metric evolution. At the top, stop here, you see the evolution uh, over time of, uh, for the metric G G here to two. Uh, I just move it just to see the, the evolution. So at the beginning uh, here, it's flat, uh, almost flat actually. And then as you see amplitude, uh, the amplitude is uh, getting uh, larger and larger. At the final, final time, you see uh, here at the bottom, uh, the result, you have uh, the metric uh, G00, it is moved uh, to plus 1.9 because it's minus one if it is uh, flat. Um, this metric, the red one, is uh, just moved uh, to the top here to see that, and um, and the two others are fluctuating, and it's clearly that there is uh, an anti-correlation here. So clearly, I mean, this is not the picture that we have in mind for a star or planet. It's turbulent, so the metric is you know, fluctuations, and uh, we've here at the finite time uh, a fluctuation of um, more than ten percent, which is, I mean, the beginning of the end for weak turbulence. Uh, what does it mean physically here? The fact that we have different behavior. G00 corresponds actually to the, to, to the time. And that means in weak gravitational wave turbulence, uh, we have a natural, uh, what we call cosmic time. This term, I mean, this contribution is mainly flat. It's not exactly flat, there are some fluctuations. But the main fluctuations comes from the two other contribution. And the last one is flat again why our interpretation is that we don't have Z dependence. And this one actually corresponds to uh, the Z part. I mean, the Z, the, the, the Z part of the, um, of the metric. So this is probably the reason why it is uh, different. Okay, so this is uh, well, the simulation. Now, I don't know if I have time, but uh, I would like to say a word about uh, beyond weak wave turbulence. So please and, go on, I mean, you can take- yeah, so now, we are up to the application to cosmology. So beyond weak turbulence means strong turbulence, first of all. So from a point of view of turbulence, if I take uh, the picture on the left, uh, I, okay, we have, if we excite at Ki, then we have a universe cascade and so on. But at some point, because the ratio between the wave time and the nonlinear time scales like L to the power one third, when you go to the right, to the left, sorry, uh, uh, that means L uh, increases. So at some point, if even if we start with small values, then it, it, it becomes of order one. So turbulence becomes strong. What happens then? We need a model or we need simulation. I don't have simulation for the moment. This is the next step that I want to develop for the next years. But we have a model and the model is called critical balance. It's often used in plasma physics, um, but not only in plasma physics. So if we just assume that this model is valid, then we say that this ratio is one. And if this ratio is one, we can actually find and predict uh, the spectrum of strong wave turbulence. So below, I show you uh, here uh, 
um, this uh, spectrum. So just take care, this is not uh, the wave action. Now I plot the, the, the spectrum for the metric fluctuation. So that means two thirds means five thirds. Well, it's not Kolmogorov, but <laughs> uh, we observe my five, five thirds here. So five thirds here, okay, we have an inverse cascade. And then um, we have a minus one for strong wave turbulence, okay? So um, this is um, uh, uh, the prediction for, 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 for this. Room. So what happens then? I mean, minus one in terms of inverse cascade means that we still uh, uh, have uh, possibly uh, uh, an explosive inverse cascade, okay? So let's make this assumption. So then we are able to actually uh, uh, excite the slow mode, k equals zero, because of this inverse cascade. But we can excite this slow mode very quickly. We can have a sharp increase of the slow mode. And then, I mean, this kind of thing is discussed in literature or in different problems, but in turbulence. But here, when we excite, when the slow mode, k equals zero uh, for the metric uh, in, in, uh, increases, that means actually we have uh, expansion of the universe. So if we have a fast increase, we have inflation. Inflation means fast expansion. So this is a discussion that we had in this paper published last year to explain that this mechanism may predict, may explain uh, inflation uh, with this uh, turbulence uh, inverse cascade. Okay, and there is also an inverse cascade, but as I told you, this is slow, this is fast. So the physics will be dominated by the inverse cascade. Okay, so now if I come back here, why it is important? It is important, as I told you at the beginning of my presentation, we have inflation uh, phase here that must be explained. And there is a model based on particle physics uh, where uh, there is um, a scalar field called inflaton, but well, it's, this is an assumption and actually there's a lot of criticism now today, uh, for example, in this paper, because for this model, the initial condition must be very well defined. There is this fine tuning, uh, tuned, I mean, parameters that is uh, crucial for that explanation. In my case, I mean, in our case, for this problem based on turbulence, well, turbulence can uh, just, I mean, develop and uh, because and it, it can be fast and actually it can also stop at some point because if I come back here, uh, if we have this fast, this sharp increase of the condensate, if we have this inflation, inflation means also dilution, right? So the metric fluctuation will decrease and then we have naturally a scenario to stop inflation because if we have dilution, then the nonlinear physics, nonlinear effect will be much weaker and then the cascade will stop. So naturally we have a way to stop it also. And that's very interesting. So finally, the last question is, and to finish my uh, presentation here, it's can we compare with data? This is a big question. Well, if we assume that K minus one is a final spectrum, um, then we have this, this uh, dilution, okay? Uh, the process stops. And dilution means basically a self-similar decay of the K minus one. So uh, the metric fluctuation will be weaker and weaker. And the point is that, uh, that we, we realized in this paper published last year is that if we just now play with uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, dimensional arguments here by using this relation uh, between uh, the density and the gravitational potential, we can arrive to um, a spectrum for that quantity, which is this one that people actually discuss in, in the literature. There's a lot of discussion about that. And the point is that now we can even compare with Planck because Planck data observes the CMB. And from the CMB, they are able to, uh, with some assumptions, because you have here uh, the fact that the fluctuation of temperature is proportional to the fluctuation of density, very small. They are able to also say, if we have the spectrum for the temperature, we have the spectrum for the density. But now if we have the spectrum for the density, we have the spectrum for the potential here. So we can compare. And the point is that in my language, if I stay in turbulence, if I take this uh, metric, uh, um, the spectrum of the metric, the, the, the Planck data are in agreement with K minus 1.033. In our case, as I told you, it's K minus one. So I think it is sufficiently close to be relevant, I think, for that problem. I don't claim that this is a solution of the problem, but we are not outside completely outside of, of, the, of the observation, okay.
So this is my conclusion. Uh, maybe uh, you can read it. Just what I want to say is that in our last paper with DNS, we have been able to prove that turbulence is possible in general relativity, which is already a big message in cosmology because it's not really I think, accepted, maybe more and more. Um, and uh, one of the referees that we had this night, <laughs> the answer, uh, the last referee, the fourth referee said, well, it is probably very interesting for this uh, primordial gravitational waves. So he was convinced, so that's good. Uh, so I um, hope that more and more people will be uh, convinced that it is interesting at least. Um, and now for the future, for the application, so the first part it was, is about I mean, turbulence, the second part is about the application here. And um, the next step will be, of course, to do DNS of strong gravitational wave tubes. That's uh, the main uh, uh, I mean, uh, perspective for, for me in the next, the next years. And my last comment here is that, uh, since I'm talking about turbulence, there is a strong, actually, um, uh, proximity with uh, elastic wave turbulence. So that means we can even imagine uh, experiments uh, um, to understand, uh, uh, I will say, uh, the universe in, in lab in somehow. So that's, uh, I like this uh, conclusion. Here. So thank you very much, Pierre. Okay, so Sebastian, for a very interesting